episode six, maybe. I don't know. I don't, the numbers don't matter, but all I know is it's working class on DeerCast. We are actually in the working class bow hunter studio, and uh, Austin Chandler here, Kurt Geyer, Austin Chandler, my guest slash just a guy I'm podcasting with. <laughs> How's it going, buddy? It's going good, man. How are you? Pretty good. Pretty good. At this point in time, when this episode launches, recording time from launch time is always different in what I call podcast land. Things are heating up or have heated up, and at this point, guys have killed deer or they're still working on killing deer. Maybe they're working on killing their second deer. Yep. Wherever you're at, we're going to talk November strategies, a little bit of a blanket term there because depending on where you're at November or when you're listening to this, it could be the first week of November or the last week of November. So we're going to try and cover a little bit of both and talk about a few other things in between all that. Um, for people who don't know you, I mean, if they listen to the normal working class bow hunter series, you're one part of our crew. You're on all the time. Uh, we call you the Lord because you kill a lot of big <laughs> bucks um, as a joke. And it just kind of like rolled in with our listeners. But uh, I guess give a, a brief background on who you are and what you do if, for people who don't know you. Okay. Yeah. Uh, my name's Austin Chandler. I'm a farmer from West Central Illinois. Um, being a farmer kind of gives me an upper hand. I get to kind of scout while I'm working. So it works yeah. out well. Yeah. Yeah. Um, born and raised in the same area my whole life. I've been chasing big whitetail since I was 15. I got lucky and arrowed a really nice deer for my first buck and just was uh, been ate up with big deer ever since. So yeah. really have been interested in uh, big deer behavior and how to find big deer every season. So that's kind of... From your first deer pretty much yep. because you got, I guess... It's a good thing it happened the way it did because it got your mindset caught up a little quicker than it would have if you would have shot some smaller deer, right? And right. up to it. Yeah, normally it's kind of a gradual progression for guys. For me, I shot that first one and I was just so interested in <laughs> large whitetails that I just kept at it and kept at it and passed small deer at a young age. And yeah. by the time I was 25, I was starting to get a pretty impressive collection. Yeah, I mean, we can run a reel through of just some of the deer you've killed. You've killed, it, I would say you've killed a little bit of every type of whitetail. Like, you know, you have tall ones, you got wide ones, you got just ones that, well, we have an episode on working class called Brow Tines, Kickers, and Mass. That's yep. one of my favorite deer you've ever shot. You got double drop tines, you got double throat patches, you got traditional archery bucks. So you you are very experienced in the whitetail game. Um, so if, if people don't know you when we talk about this stuff, just know that it's not coming from nowhere. We're not making this up. It's, you've done a lot of this. <laughs> well... We have a lot of fun doing it. I mean, I yeah. like I said, I don't get burned out on it. Uh, it's a lifestyle. Mm -hmm. You know, my wife gets burned out on it, but I don't. <laughs> yeah, my wife probably does too. But oh, we got troopers of wives. You know, they're dealing with we something do. a little more extreme than yep. the, the weekend warrior type of guy. You know, we live and breathe this 24-7, 365 um, from podcast into the trade show season. And to, uh, I mean, we had a pretty good group of guys with working class bow hunter. Like we find reasons to get together all year round to it hang is. out as like as a hunting camp. You yeah. Know? It's year round. I mean, we're, uh, mm -hmm. if we're not talking about deer, we're talking about podcast and it's pretty much all year round. It is. Yeah. Yeah. It's just good, man. It's good to have friends like that, that all oh, yeah. have a similar passion or the same passion, not really similar to the same. Um, so let's talk about November a little bit. Uh, I don't know where you want to start, um, because we have a few things, you know, the rut is kind of like, a, there's a lot, I feel like as it progresses in the years and the industry matures and, podcast has been out for longer and it kind of grabs a hold of these different personalities. You hear of a lot more guys saying they hate the rut because it's sporadic. Yeah. It's, it's really hard to find a big deer and catch him doing something that's predictable yeah. during the time frame of November, specifically the first couple weeks of November. Mm -hmm. um, all hell kind of breaks loose. It's just, uh, it's chaos. And, and that's I, why a lot of guys love it. Yeah, I, I love it. I mean, if mm -hmm. I had to pick a week to hunt, it's the first seven days of November. Yeah. I just, I really, I've had a lot of success those first seven days of November. Yeah, I mean, it's fun because it goes from, I mean, a lot of guys can experience that October lull and then just shortly after, a few weeks later, you know, it's the rut. And then you get this sporadic, chaotic, um, you can be sitting there one second and not seeing anything. Next thing you know, three bucks run underneath you. Yeah. Three bucks you would shoot after one hot doe. So, yeah, things get crazy. I think we're guys, to clarify, earlier when I said some guys don't like it, those guys are the guys that are trying to be more honed in and hunt a specific whitetail and get in front of them and calculate and kill him you know, on the day he thinks he's going to kill him. Yep. Well, then this rut comes around and things get crazy. And then the, all of that starts to lose grasp. <laughs> and then those guys are like, man, now you're just playing 
the luck game a little bit. It can be frustrating when you've got a bead on one in October <laughs> and you haven't got him killed yet. And then here comes the rut and he's two miles away. But mm -hmm. there's just something cool about sitting in the stand and the element of surprise and not knowing what's going to come down that trail. Definitely, I think yeah. that's what keeps me coming back every year is just not knowing when Mr. 200 might come trotting down the trail. Agreed. That's what I like about it. Cause you can be sitting there and if you're feeling down, you're not seeing much or whatever, and it's slow or you're kind of bored. You always have that awesome optimistic, like voice screaming in your ear. Like it's November, like yeah. sweet November. Like Mark <laughs> always says, it's like, this is the time you think about all year round. You know, this is when deer are on their feet more than any other time. Yeah. Big deer. I mean, October you're getting pictures of big deer and mm -hmm. they're predictable, but they don't spend the amount of time on their feet that they do no. in November. Your, your odds of seeing big mature whitetail on their feet are no better than that first 10 or 15 days in November. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Agreed. I mean, it's, that's hard to argue with just yeah. in general, you know? So what are some rut strategies that you try to implement in your game plan? Um, you know, just let's talk the rut in general, you know, if we're talking November one to wherever in November, I'm yeah. um, into late November. Cause you know, the rut, it, it's kind of like a roller coaster. You might not see anything for three days, but then the next four days, it's just on fire. Right. You know, so that's also the fun of it and the frustrating part about it. But what, what do you do to try and basically put yourself in the best position possible? Well, I'm kind of picky on the caliber of deer that I hunt. So I'm looking, you know, for solid deer, old deer, like five-year-old deer. Mm -hmm. um, I have a lot of cell cameras going. And like I said, you can't really, I'm taking inventory more than trying to develop a pattern during the rut, right? So if I see a deer that's on a farm, that's a caliber I want to hunt, that makes me spend more time on one farm versus another, or one part of a farm versus another. Gotcha. Um, so I cell cameras and cameras in general play a big part into my strategy. Um, I'm very mobile when I hunt. So I do have my certain pre-hung stands that are always good during the rut. Mm -hmm. And then I've got, you know, a saddle or a stand that I bring with me and I'll, if I'm not seeing what I want to see, then I'll get mobile and I move around and, yeah. you know, just try to work around and find the deer and it, and food can come into play too. Like if you're on, if you're finding does, you're going to find the bucks, right? So yeah. don't, don't make it harder than it has to be. Right. Yeah. 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 That's, that's a good point too. Like don't overthink things. I think that's pretty easy to do yep. for a lot of guys, especially when they're playing the, the hang and hunt, the hang and bang, the mobile game. It's like, you, Oh, you know, move your stand a lot, be, be there, but almost just kind of slow down a little bit and read what's actually happening before you make this, this play that you're trying to make. That's full of a ton of effort right. and energy because you can burn yourself out. You make a bunch of wrong moves or a bunch of moves a day late yep. and you're always behind. It's hard to keep that motivation up for a whole month. Well, when you've got 170 or 80 or whatever that you're chasing, you can pull your hair out because you're getting <laughs> pictures of him. You know he's there, but when you hunt, you're not seeing him or whatever. Yep. You want to you wanna try to move around and figure things out and get this perfect play. And, and mm -hmm. during the rut, sometimes it's going to happen when and where you least expect it. So yeah, that's going back to the beauty of it. I, I think, and I imagine you do this a lot, but I mean, maybe we should probably talk about like terrain a little bit because mm -hmm. um, I guess like the highest odds of an opportunity on a buck that's chasing does or being sporadic would be the highest traffic areas, like a pinch point, yeah. a funnel, whatever you call it, yeah, you know, natural terrain features. Natural or man-made. I mean, I've got, you know, places where we own uh, bulldozing equipment. We'll have a brush pile pushed up and they'll go around that brush pile. I mean, look for anything that's going to concentrate deer traffic. It could be a ridge. It could be, you know, a saddle that kind of crosses in between two ridges. Mm -hmm. um, they'll follow they'll follow terrain features, you know, you'll, yep. and, and if you're kind of unsure, you can hang back with a safe wind and observe one night and just kind of watch the deer and see what they're doing in that area. But yeah, yeah. the longer you're on the farm, the more you're going to learn how the deer kind of move through it. Definitely. I, I've learned like how deer use a farm in the past and honestly kind of by accident by leaving like a non cell camera up on a property and just random spots and basically setting them and forgetting about them until like after shed season, mm -hmm. I'll go in and collect my cameras, take the batteries out of them, check cards. And then there's like, man, on November, you know, whatever the date span was like, there's a lot of deer moving through here at like 9 30 AM, like probably a spot to look at. Yep. And like, why are they there? You know? So, um, I know Mark's mentioned something about that. He likes to put up a camera and like for a year and then just let back, it go, let yep. it sit and just see you know, you can kind of get a good overview of what's happening in that spot, you know. I'm never that patient unless I forget one. <laughs> I try to forget them and just pay attention to, like, 
ones that make sense for me to check. Yeah. Um, I'm actually probably going to do that time of recording, you know, um, we're a little before November here, but time of rec uh, recording, I'm probably going to do that over the next week is put out like three or four non cell cameras and set them out and just, just leave them. Let them slow cook. Yeah. Let them, let them slow cook. Yeah. But there's just a couple that I'll probably check just so I, I, if I need to get a lead on another buck, I can, I wonder what's going on just in case you slip in when it's right. And, yep. but other than that, uh, leave them alone Yeah, and just see, basically put those in certain terrain features to see what's going on with deer, um, especially on newer ground. Yep. But go ahead. Yeah. Well, that, uh, I mean, just knowing your farm and knowing the way that deer kind of move through it, that's, that's a big one for um, sure. And like I said, you know, don't overlook food, even though you think, well, a buck's not going to come out here and feed. Well, if he knows that does are going to be in that field feeding, it's a simple thing that guys overlook a lot. A lot of times I'll just go to an easy stand that's easy to get to on the edge of a food source and mm -hmm. just kind of sit back and watch. And sometimes that's where your giant's going to be. He's going to be coming out there checking does in that food source. Yeah, just because he wasn't there the, in early October doesn't mean he's not right. going to check does. And he yeah. might not necessarily be feeding, right? He's not coming to the food, but he's he's coming to the party. He's coming to the dance floor. <laughs> it it kind of goes back to, uh, we did the podcast, I don't know, it's been a couple of years now with Clint Casper. He compared the rut kind of like going out to the bars and like chasing girls around. Yep. I mean, you know, he used some pretty vulgar. There's a lot of parallels there. <laughs> yeah, they're, they're, <laughs> I mean, really, I mean, you think about it, like it's the dance floor. And I know Chansey uses that term a lot. You know, if the does are out on the dance floor, you're going to have bucks look in there and see what's going on in whatever clover plot or a hay yep. field or cut corn or whatever, Yep. you know? Um, and I've also seen it to where I think a lot of those get burnt out on being in the open and get chased around after you get into late November. They do. And it changes a Your little bit. Your strategy is going to change as November progresses. Mm -hmm. Yep. That's what's fun, man. Just being on your toes a little bit, but like always being on the ball, like seeing what's going on when deer are switching things up over whatever day span, like a transition, if you will, and, and getting in there. That's, yep. I mean, it's just rut stuff. It's, fu it's fun and frustrating, but it's fun there's, and oh, frustrating there's always the some kind time. of action usually, you know? <laughs> So what's your least favorite thing about it? The lockdown period can be frustrating. You, you start getting into like November 12, 15, 17 through that area. Uh, when those big, those big mature deer have their doe picked out yeah. and they're, they're locked down with her. It can get, you can spend a lot of hours on stand and see mediocre deer, but finding those big ones when they're locked down can be pretty tricky. Yeah. Yeah. So, but you know, then too, is eventually those deer are going to get back up. They do. And I'm, I'm, I try to always be ready for that. Like around that 15th, 17th mark, you can, uh, you can get back on some of these big deer that are looking for doe number two. So in that phase where they're in lockdown, are you hunting through it hard? I, I don't stop in November. Just, yeah. I mean, it can happen at any time. Like you can, you get a buck that gets on one of the old does first, you know, she comes in the heat first. He might be, she might be, uh, coming out of heat and he's on a lockdown there for a couple of days searching. You never know when that opportunity is going to present itself. So yeah, definitely. I don't let up a whole lot in November. Yeah, you can't. I mean, because there's always, it's, it's not to say like this date is when lockdown ends exactly. or starts. And every know? year it's a little different. And uh, yeah, like I said, the, the age of the doe determines a lot. Mm -hmm. um, hell, you know, we talk about the rut. We, we chase these deer clear through December into January and still see rut-like activity as these yep. cycles change. But mm -hmm. we're not talking about that today. We're just talking about November, but... Classic rut, I yeah, guess, yeah. You just try to, you keep a, you're trying to paint a general picture in your head of what's going on out there in the woods. And typically mid-November is going to get a little tricky on big old mature deer. But if you're patient and you keep putting your time in, that deer you've been looking for might just come strolling through. Mm -hmm. Like, for instance, uh, Ross last year, our good buddy, Ross Bigger, mm -hmm. he killed a giant, a 201 or two inch mm -hmm. massive buck. He had had very few pictures of him, uh, knew he was in this area. It's funny because he thought he was like 180s at best. Yeah. <laughs> well, he him. was, he just, it happened so fast. He didn't have much time to judge him. And like I said, didn't have hardly any pictures of him, a few yeah. blurry ones, but this deer, it is around, I think he said November 17th. It was right before our first gun season. Mm -hmm. Ross goes in, he's known as High Noon Ross, right? He likes to kill these big deer midday. <laughs> High Noon Ross. He calls me at like 2.15 in the afternoon. He's like, dude, I just shot a mega giant. Mm -hmm. Two o'clock, this deer is strolling, cruising from one ridge top to the other, looking for, just checking for does. I does. forgot it was like it early was afternoon. 2.15 when he killed that thing. I so, forgot about that. Like I said, you never know, you know, he was going in on a hunch. 
Mm -hmm. Um, but it paid off because he was in the right spot. He was in a spot where does bed up on those ridges yeah, yeah. and that big boy was cruising through checking for him. Yeah. I mean, money right there. That's yep. goes into what we're talking about. It's just the, the predictability and the, the uncertainty of the rut, like what can happen. Yep. But yeah, just absolute slob, just cruising. Yep. I, I forgot it was like late afternoon, early afternoon, however you want to look at it. Any time of day. I mean, in, when you start looking and start lining everything up, like, uh, high pressure, you know, your barometer is mm -hmm. rising and then the moon phase lines up and the temperatures are lining yeah. up. When all this stuff starts lining up, it's time to be out there setting because yeah. the odds of that big deer being up on his feet are so high right there. You can't miss it. For sure. And that's deer cast makes that, uh, that judgment call a little easier. Use uh, it every day. I do too. Yep. It's a, it's a, it's a very n new, newer as in the last couple of years, prominent tool in my my tool bag, you know, yep. it's, it's part of my game plan. It's the first app I've used when I go in and check and see what's going on, especially, you know, in, into October, you know, you can see what's happening when, and when it's going to hit, when you think it's going to be good. But, but anyway, um, yeah, I mean, that's like the cool thing about it. So let's talk about the stand setups because are you, are you typically sitting all day during this time frame? Ross likes to set more midday than I do. I've always been kind of a morning and evening type guy. Same here. Yeah. But like also I also go out at like 10 Yeah, He likes to get out there about 10 o'clock and he'll set through end of the evening. Now, mm -hmm. with that being said, like I said, when all those factors line up and everything is right, I those are the days that I'll pick for my all day sets. Might only be three or four days in a season. Mm -hmm. Or if I see a really big deer in the morning, I'll have a snack in my pack and I'll be prepared to set all day if need be. Yeah. yeah. What, what do you do with your stand setups? Um, no matter what brand any out, anybody out there uses, what uh, what do you do to make sure that you're comfortable for a situation like that? Because that, that's key, you know, to be in there all day, you have to be comfortable. Yeah. Well, have a platform that you're comfortable on. I'm a smaller guy, so I fit well on a smaller platform. I mean, I, I would just as soon have a smaller lightweight stand and I don't have to lug around a big platform. Yeah. Um, a nice quiet set of climbing sticks, get up and down the tree, a nice quiet tree stand, yeah. uh, get a good butt pad and yeah. be prepared to sit there for, you know, six, seven, eight hours if you need to. Yeah. I, I try to do different things. I've realized, I, and I'm curious if you do this because I'm very particular when I set up a stand, no, ma no matter if it's a pre- hang setup or if it's a mobile setup for me i always carry in my pack one of the bigger bow hangers so like if a deer comes in i'm reaching in front of me like you yeah. don't need i'm not doing this crazy weird that's usually thing. what i do you do <laughs> I, well my pack's kind of limited on space so i'll run like a smaller oh, hook, yeah, your but, fanny pack well that's what i used to run <laughs> now now i'm running a full size backpack because i got too much stuff with me but yeah, yeah yeah you always i mean whether you're running a full length bow hook or a smaller hook you got to have a couple of them to hang some gear on see I've, I've hunted some of my other buddy stands in the past and i've realized they don't use bow hangers or gear hooks i'm like where do you put your backpack where do you put your stuff? And and maybe I thought I was just fancy because I always do the nice fold out bow hanger. Yeah. So it's, I don't have to reach. And then at least the one fold, yeah. not necessarily a trifold, but at least no smaller than that. They are nice. Unless I'm hanging like, unless I have to hunt like a left-handed set and then I can use a smaller one because I'm reaching around the other way. Do you know what I'm saying? Like yeah. it's hanging different and then always a gear hook for yeah. my backpack. And then, I always have extra gear hooks because if I want to hang the paracord for my rattling antlers or the lanyard for my grunt tube, what I'll do is I'll let the, I'll hang my backpack up higher and I'll hang, I'll let my grunt tube sit in the top of my pack mm -hmm. and I'll have that tether go to the hook above my backpack hook. Nice. So it's always, it's ready to if go. If I got to grab it and get that buck's attention, if he's cutting through quick, it's right there. Yep. So yeah, I just try to be fancy and comfortable and have everything. No, that's nice. Right there. I mean, in the heat of the moment, having little easy things to get to can make the difference between making that wrong noise at the wrong time. You know, if you yeah. go for your grunt call and you ting something off your pack, it's not good. Yeah. I always wear my grunt call around my neck. Um, oh, do you really? Wearing a bino harness this year has made that a little more tricky. So I'm mm -hmm. still trying to perfect my system there. But um, yeah, between my range finder and my grunt call there on my neck. So I've got like two things shoved in my jacket. So I'm still perfecting my method there. And behind your, your harness. Yeah. Well, it's weird. You can't, it's hard to hunt without loopholes once you start hunting with them. Yeah. I'm rocking the loopholes and then uh, the loophole range finder and mm -hmm. they're, they're money. It's nice. I'm using 12 by 50s 
Yep. This season. So you got like more of a glassing style. You've got a big, you've got a big pair. Mine are 10 by 42s. That's normally what I run is yep. the 10 by 42s. But I took the 12 by 50s to Wyoming. Mm -hmm. um, and I found I'm, I'm, you know, the focus knob. Mm -hmm. I'm rocking that a little harder being more magnification. Yep. You know, I have to use it more than I do with my 10 by 42s. Still nice in the open fields back here though. And you've got that it's extra great. magnification. It's great. Yep. You know, you can see it's, it's, it's amazing how much more you can get out of it. You see, I arguably twice as many deer. Yeah. Maybe, you know, I spotted some deer last night when I hunted that I wouldn't have seen without my binos. Well, and when you're hunting, when you're getting picky and you're hunting big caliber animals, it's nice to know what you're looking at. And sometimes mm -hmm. when they're four or 500 yards away, it's nice to have that extra magnification. Well, that too, if like, if they're, if you got a big buck, let's we'll just make this scenario. I've got a big buck chasing the doe down to you. It's November 15th, whatever day. And you can look at him. Sorry, here comes a deer. Okay, that's a buck I want to shoot. You put them back in your harness. You grab your bow, your grunt, to, whatever you got to do just in case and be ready. Yep. Versus waiting until he's up in your wheelhouse and then you're messing around trying to grab your bow and all your stuff. Yep. And so it helps you. You get a lead up on it. Yep. You know, but uh, we'll start calling a little bit then since we're getting in there. I yep. mean, I've always known you to be a guy who does not blind call. I don't. I don't typically blind call. The only time I would blind call is if I hear something that's going to make me blind call. Like, so I might hear a, a deep grunt or hear some rustling around in the brush and I want to know what it is. So I'll give on a grunt to see, but yeah, I don't just sit there and call to call. Mm -hmm. Um, it's just too easy to get picked down or have a big deer come in on the wrong side slip, of you. Slip on you. Yeah. Yeah. But I do like to call. Now, okay. typically when I'm calling, I'm, I've already seen the deer that I want to come in and he's not coming the way I want him to, so I call at him. Okay. Give, me, I, give I, me a scenario. Like uh, Buck steps out, he goes the opposite way. What are you doing? What's the, what's the first thing you're doing trying yeah, to get his attention? I'll, I'll, give a, I'll give a grunt out to get his attention once I know he's heard it. Um, if he acts like he's interested, then I just back off. If he doesn't, then I'll get a little more aggressive with the call. Mm -hmm. um, I've got an old call in my pack. I've had it for years. It, it's the mad buck growl. Mm -hmm. And I've killed like, I don't know, seven or eight big deer with this thing. But What year did that come out? I killed my first big deer with it in 2009. So I'm guessing it was probably, I don't know, 06, 07, 08, somewhere in there. Yeah, I but, would think we were watching the video about it that they did back in the day, the mad deer call buck growl. So it came with a little miniature instructional DVD yep. where we found the digital version on YouTube. It's kind of became a joke on the podcast. Now I get, I get like five snaps a week of guys going to the local farm King or yeah. farm and fleet or wherever you shop at and sending me a picture of the, the buck growl. It's like the last one they have. They're buying. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, yeah, it's, it is kind of cool. I can't argue with the results. Like for whatever reason, the tone of that call seems to infuriate big deer. They have to come in and check it out and for people wondering that kind of brings it to like what the new version is of yeah now. i guess that the generations down the line uh which is the so that was the mad buck growl but now we're talking about the hunter hunter specialties buck bark buck bark and there's a yeah. jury outdoors um edition version of that yeah. call and we're but, getting ready to get our hands on some of those and test those out so yeah, i'm yeah. anxious to see how it holds up compared to the old buck growl something about the way those calls looked and felt though yeah you know what i mean with the clear plastic yep. acrylic or whatever the hell it was and i don't know just cool there's like a nostalgia to it now for sure but so you got that call that's you in your bag of tricks yep i i don't hesitate if i see the deer that i want to shoot and he's walking away from me or doesn't seem to be coming my way i won't hesitate to call at that deer mm -hmm. now if he's with other deer or there are other deer behind me. I mean, every, you know, every situation's different. And something that I found that's really effective is if you're in thick terrain, it, the calling seems to be 10 times more effective. Like if you're yeah. kind of in the open where that deer can figure out what's going on, I'll probably leave the call on my neck. Mm -hmm. But if, uh, if I think I can get him to come in and investigate, I won't hesitate, especially in November. They're just so fired up. Yeah. And can you elaborate on that a little bit? Like, say, like if he's in a hay field and he can see everything, Right. If you're sitting on the edge of a field and he's already in that field, like now if there's a bunch of thick stuff behind you where you think, well, he might come in and try to yeah. figure it out, you know, that's a, that's a scenario where you could call. I, I rattled in and I want to talk rattling now. I want to go to that. But I rattled in my first successful kill the buck from rattling last year on my buck with that little drop time. And I found, I learned this firsthand. There was, I knew he was on the other side of the standing corn and I rattled knowing he couldn't see where I was. Mm -hmm. So that gave me time. Same concept. To rattle, put my antlers down, and be ready. And then here he comes 
out of the standing corn. Yep. So that guy, I think that's what you're talking about. Exactly. Will you ever see a buck going the other way and go straight to a rattle? I don't rattle a whole lot. If I want to get really something that can really reach out there and they can hear it, I'll snort wheeze. And I really? just, I usually just do it with my mouth, but mm-hmm. there, I mean, there are, are calls out there that you can snort wheeze with and get a little louder. But typically if a deer is two or 300 yards away and you want to get their attention, you can snort wheeze at them. Mm-hmm. Now it is an aggressive call. So keep in mind, we just had a buddy, we were just <laughs> talking, talking about, about a story. You, if you've got a deer coming towards you and you just throw a snort wheeze at him, it might not turn out the way <laughs> you want it to, right? You want to kind of ease into that if you can. Freaks them out. Yeah. But if you're a long ways off, if there's a deer a long ways off mm-hmm. and, and he can't hear you grunting, a snort wheeze is an option as well. Yeah. And very subtle. I, from what my experience, I've only um, snort wheeze had a handful of deer, but it's always been bigger bucks. Mm-hmm. And it's very like, I'll grunt or snort wheeze, grunt. And then if he doesn't respond, then I'll hit him with a snort. Normally that gets them like, whoa, who's that? Yeah. They already know that there's something there. And then they hear that and it might be enough to kind of tip the scales. Yeah. Kind of get them all, get them mad about it. But I've noticed like once you throw one snort wheeze at him, you're not throwing another one for a while. Usually you don't. <laughs> that that deer that we podcasted about, that brow tines, kickers and mass deer, that was a cool situation where I was in thick enough terrain. I had him fired up and I, I'd snort wheezed at him once already and let mm-hmm. him rake on a tree and he acted like he might come in, he might not. And he went to turn away and I hit him again and that's all it took. I mean, he didn't even hesitate. He just turned his head and couldn't and come into me. He just was so fired up, he couldn't take it. I feel like the snort wheeze and even grunting in certain situations like that takes um, a little bit deeper knowledge on like deer body postures yep. and behavior. It does, but there's only one <clears throat> way to learn it really. I mean, try, if yeah. you want to figure it out and see how deer react to it, there's really only one way to do it. And that's just to start trying. Yeah. Um, yeah. I always had a joke. Uh, I think I've talked about in the podcast, so you grunt or you maybe grunt a little too much where it just kind of turns them off and they just walk away from you and all they do, they give you the ear. You can know they hear it, but they're not looking. And that's like the equivalent to like the middle finger, the middle finger, <laughs> you know, as they're walking away and yep. you're just like, I tried. Yep. But <laughs> well, too, too much can be, can hurt you too. I mean, you have mm-hmm. to know when to call, you have to know how much to call. And I can't say that I know everything, but I've played the game for 20 years. I mean, yeah. I know enough to be dangerous, I guess. Yeah. How, yeah. how many deer do you think you've killed because of a call? Seven, eight, ten. I, I'd have to, I'd have to look through the wall and kind of pick them out. But I've uh, over a third of my deer I've called in. Really? Yeah. That's impressive. Yeah. So I would say, I mean, you know more, not that you know more that you're leading on, but uh, you're being humble. That's a lot, dude. That's a, that's a major. It's always been an effective strategy for me. Yeah. And like I said, I don't know if it's because I'm sitting in the combine all through October, but my best time to hunt's always been those first seven to 10 days in November and yeah. calling during that time is just money. Yeah. It, it I mean, it makes out. sense, right? It all adds up, but that's gotta be, people probably think you're lucky because you're, you know, you're a farmer, you get to you basically scout while you work and all this stuff. But I mean, how long it's by the time of recording, we're into the end of October here. You've been only been hunting twice, three times. Yep. October is usually not my time to shine. Yeah. Um, I'll let you send me pictures, all the big ones you're killing in October and I'll yeah. dream about it. But once I get in the tree, November is usually my time to shine. Does it eat alive not getting to go out in October? Yeah, especially when I get to picture that big one and I still got two or 300 acres to finish <laughs> on harvest. <laughs> yeah. Well, you just hope that they're, they're, you know, nighttime photos. So it keeps you, keeps you a little more calm until you get done with harvest. Yep. Well, I mean, our buddy Ross, we're going to probably do an, end up doing a late season podcast with him for this series. He hasn't been out at all. He he texted us yep. in our group chat. I, boys, I don't think I'm getting out till December. And that's not uh, that's not abnormal for Ross. A no, lot of times no. he'll have to work through November. He might hit a couple of primo days. Yeah. And uh, Ross is the late season king. I mean, that's his time to shine. Yeah. That's when he gets on really big deers in the late season. Mm-hmm. And yeah. I, and the, the longer I hunt, I can see more and more value in that late season hunt. But those big deer get yeah. predictable, but. Yeah. Um, See, I've always been a rut guy. I just love the rut. Yeah. And I, I, you know, I'm with you there. Definitely. I'm turning, I'm for some reason turning into an October guy, which I never thought would happen, but, uh, you but know, it just means you're getting good. You're figuring it out too early. <laughs> yeah. I don't know about that. <laughs> Dude, I'm on the phone with my buddies all the time. You will be in one of them trying to like, you know, put together game plans, but I just enjoy getting, trying to get ahead of them. It's fun. Yeah. Especially when it can come together early. It doesn't always work that way. Yep. So I'll take it when it happens, but I get anxiety a little bit because you and Ross are, you guys have that late season mindset a little bit. Like for me, I don't really have late season 
in the back of my head. Like I'm thinking October, November, those are the times to get it done, get in there and get an arrow in one. But you're right though. There's a lot of value in the late season and it's probably the easiest time to kill a big deer. Yeah. In my opinion. I mean, if you can stomach the cold, it's probably the easiest time to kill a big mature whitetail. Yeah. To me, it gives me anxiety thinking about waiting to the late season or like letting the big buck buck simmer until the late season. But I wonder if just because I have young kids at home that I'm like trying to tag out early. So I'm not stretching family time. thin. I'm not making my wife mad. I'm trying to uh, listen, honey, I'm doing the best I can. I'm trying to tag out early so I can hang out and go to all the holiday functions and all that stuff. Well, that, and you know, the days that the deer move in the late season are uh, the brutal the brutal days, the cold days. What is a uh, slaves to their stomach? They're slaves to their stomach. That's right. And, and that ends up. I mean, we'll, we'll, I mean, we'll cover a lot of this. Yeah, with we're Ross. getting into the late season. Yeah, yeah. We're supposed to be talking about. We're giving lot, Ro- we're giving Ross credit when he, we still have a podcast to do with Ross. <laughs> um, but that's just. I don't know. I don't. I don't think about late season much. Um, but my properties always haven't been set up. They've been more set up for October and more rut type properties. Some properties are more conducive to an October hunt. Mm -hmm. Um, I've got good rut farms. Yeah. Some are good late season farms. Just kind of, I guess you get good at hunting that style or whatever your farm tends to, you know, hold for deer. I think that's what makes a good hunter though, too, is like being able to be a little malleable and like willing to adjust. And a lot of it's just like how much effort are you willing to put in? You know, the rut can, you can put minimal effort into it and still have good luck yeah or you can be very proactive and mobile and in my opinion have better luck um but i think in general just being a, to, to kill big bucks consistently with archery equipment you have to be a motivated individual persistence you have to be persistent yeah. you have to be thinking about game plans you have to be uh willing to pull a stand to go hang that stand right after yeah. and and go in when it's not ideal and in, in the morning early and there's a lot of efforts and different angles that you put into it that I think guys that don't do that don't really understand. Well, it's no different than anything else in life, right? I mean, those guys that, uh, to put forth the effort are going to create their, their own opportunities. And Mm -hmm. they'll seem to be the lucky guys every year, man, you're getting lucky. Well, you're creating your own luck. You get out there and you hustle and you work. Yeah. Stay persistent. Be patient. You're going to figure it out. Don't be, what do you always say? Don't be a must be nice guy. Yeah. Don't be one of the must be nice guys. <laughs> <laughs> it's easy to be that guy, man. If you, if you let yourself, I mean, I don't know. It's just like, uh, yeah, big deer don't come easy. They don't. It's, it's going to take some effort, no doubt. Mm-hmm. And like you said, they, big deer also make you pull your hair out. They will. That's your goal. You want to kill a certain caliber of white tail. A lot of people don't care about big deer. That's fine. Yep. You know, but, um, makes the game a lot easier when you don't <laughs> makes the game a lot easier. It's, uh, antlers are just interesting. And when I think antlers, I think November. Yep. Really? Uh, it's my favorite time of year. Really? It is over everything else. I, makes, if I could, like I said, if I could pick seven days, one through seven, I love November. You think one year you'll pay somebody else off to do your harvest so you can try and kill one early. It might October. come to that point. <laughs> <laughs> Step back, pay a farmhand to do all the harvest and. I'm still a young man. I've still got 20 years ahead of me, but someday I'll be able to, I'll be able to do that. <laughs> you will be only give yourself 20 years. Well, uh, 20 years of working. Of working. <laughs> yeah. I only got 20 years left. So <laughs> if I'm lucky. <laughs> hey, I'm with you, man. It's not looking good for the home team lately. <laughs> we'll figure it out. Well, man, I think that covers a lot of it. You know, we hit, I think the big three things, you know, rut strategies, calling, and uh, stand setups is important. You know, a lot of guys hunt blinds and stuff like that too. Um, our crew at Working Class Bowhunter is ninety nine point nine percent hang on tree stand. We like guys. hang on tree stands. I I've hunted on a saddles. I've hunted on of uh, like redneck blinds. I've yeah. hunted on of uh, blinds that you put on the ground. I mean, mm-hmm. like be be able to adapt. Yeah. Um, be be able to. You know, if you've got a spot that's not good for a tree stand, you know, think outside the box. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I did that mid-October and almost killed one yep. on the ground and and just a one-off type of blind that you normally wouldn't expect to. I never expected to even use one, to yep. be honest. I actually kind of laughed at the style of blind. I won't say what style of blind it is on this series, but um, it almost worked. Almost happened, didn't it? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and I'm like, well, I, you know, I put in the effort and thought, thought outside of my big buck box a little bit and, and uh, yep. almost did it. I mean, if I would have killed him out of that thing, nobody would ever heard the end of it. 
<laughs> yeah, they'd have probably been a sponsor. <laughs> <laughs> they probably would have been a sponsor, which I probably I'd talk to him, man. It, it's it it proved itself effective. Yep. Just because the deer walked up on the wrong side of what I expected him to do, I expected him to cut down when he went up one. I'm like, what are you doing? Yep. So, oh, they're smart, man. They get to be that big for a reason. Just when you think you got them figured out, they throw you through a loophole. <laughs> Anything else you want to add? No. Uh, good luck to everybody out there, and. Uh, Hope, hope everybody gets to see or shoot the buck of their dreams this year. Definitely. Awesome. Well, going into the Giant Tracker segment, thank you so much for doing this, Austin. It was Appreciate fun. Appreciate it. Yeah, a lot have, of fun. Not really outside your wheelhouse because you're in the studio all the time. We, we've sat in this seat a few times. Just a couple. <laughs> um, but, yeah, Giant Tracker segment. Hope you enjoy this. Go shoot a giant. Appreciate you guys. All right. We're back with another Giant Tracker segment. And we have John, and he's clearly working while doing this quick interview. Uh, what's going on, John? All about much, man. We're just, uh, you know, right in the middle of final harvest, trying to get some work done. <laughs> Where are you at right now? Um, well, I have in the tractor right now um, in the grain cart. In, in um, Kansas? Is that where you're at? Yes, yes sir. Very cool. So there you go. Very working class. Working while doing this interview with us, which uh, – I think is actually pretty dang cool, man. So uh, appreciate everything that the farmers do. And that leads in a lot of farmers, no big deer. And then there's a lot of farmers that don't care about big deer. So <laughs> you fall into a farmer that cares about big deer. It sounds like. Yeah, that's, that is for sure. You know, uh, yeah, a lot of guys <laughs> kind of where I'm from, these farmers here, they, uh, they really kind of despise the deer. They kind of cause a lot of issues. Yeah, we get to that point too. I'll let you uh, load in the combine here or catch the combine. There you go. Look at that. Working class on deer cast, man. <laughs> That's awesome. So let's talk about this big buck, man. You were featured in the giant tracker segment on deer cast, which is pretty cool. And I'm looking through there. I'm like, man, that deer just looks insane. So I reached out to get the story. I mean, you start it wherever you want, man. I'll let you take it. Well, it kind of all started where actually my boss, um, told me that, hey, you know, we've got a milo planted at this spot. Maybe you should check that that place out. So I was like, okay, you know, no big deal. So uh, we put out a camera on the corn pile and stuff because in Kansas, you know, it's it's legal mm -hmm. to bait deer in Kansas. Mm -hmm. And uh, actually, so we got everything set up, and then I went on vacation for a week to uh, Lake of the Ozarks mm -hmm. with, with my wife and then two of my friends. And uh, I believe it was August, August 16th. We were just playing music and having a good time and stuff. And I decided, because I use a uh, detective cam revealed drill cameras. And, mm -hmm. cameras. and I was like, well, you know, I had, you know, had a couple of beers or whatever. And I said, I was like, you know, I should open that up and see if something showed up. And the very first picture that popped up was that big giant. I mean, mm -hmm. just right away. And I just kind of almost lost my mind. I said, no, this, this can't be real. Right, right. <laughs> Yeah, you don't expect to see something like that on your trail cam. No, no, not at all. And then, you know, last year I killed a, a 207 inch non typical, which actually kind of looks the same like as this deer. It's got that triple beam on that same side and everything. Yeah. And uh, so I was just like, no, this, this, no, this doesn't happen twice. So, no, no, you know, that's crazy. You know, everybody knows that it's one thing to get pictures of a giant deer, but it's a total different thing to kill one. Yeah. Hundred percent. And uh, and so you know, of course, my wife. You know, by then the wheels were turning, and my wife, while we're on vacation, she's just like, "Oh my gosh, great!" <laughs> yeah, you sound <laughs> like me when I'm not get a picture. My wife's like, "All right, back to reality here." That's funny. Yeah, yeah, for <laughs> sure. So you know, when I got home. We kind of uh, really started to get things rolling, and. Uh, you know, get the get the blind out there and everything so they can get used to it. Because our uh, our youth season opened up. Oh, it was the first week in September, mm -hmm. and uh, and I just thought, you know, I, I didn't have any daylight pictures of this deer yet at all, and I just thought, you know, let's get things set up for youth season, you know, because with all the junk this deer's got, you know, the earlier we get him killed, the better. Yeah. Because once they start fighting. He's probably going to lose a bunch of that. Break off all the good stuff. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I was like, well, let's just get ready for youth season. Uh, youth season came and went. No days, not pictures of him. So I said, okay. And then uh, our our archery season, our kids' archery season opened up on Wednesday, I think it's September 14th. Mm -hmm. 
Mm-hmm. It opened up. I said, okay, well, I know this deer's living out in this 300-acre mile field somewhere. Mm-hmm. So I'm just going to go out there. I'm going to sit out the milo. I, I know it's miserable. There's mosquitoes. But I'm going to see if I can figure him out. Because mm-hmm. he's not up until an hour after dark. Apparently, he's bedded somewhere further away from where we're at. Yeah. So, uh, opening day archery season, I actually saw him. I found him in his bed. I was, actually, I was watching the mile field, and I saw him stand up. And uh, so I was like, okay, well, it's not really any good way to get to him. I'm just going to leave him alone. So I just did that for the next three nights. And I figured out, okay, well, he's only right here, but then, you know, 100 feet of the same area. No kidding. Yeah. yeah. It's just down the mile. You know, it's, it's not. There's not really any kind of other cover other than, you know, the four foot tall mile. Right. He's just not one place that he goes to bed, so at least one area, and that's where he stays. So, you know, so right before dark, then he gets up. Yeah. And so Saturday rolled around um, the first weekend of our season. And uh, me and one of my buddies, I've got a redneck line up on a trailer. So we decided to go ahead and grab it, hook it up to the truck. And take it over there because where he comes out of the pile and he comes into this what we call a waterway. Mm-hmm. It's actually kind of what I'm sitting in right now. Look, it's just a you know, it's just a low spot out in the field where the water drains off. Yep. And uh so right there in the mouth of the water, I said, Okay, we're gonna set this thing up. It was ninety two degrees that day. <laughs> so it was Jeez. pretty hot. Yeah, it's a hot box pretty much. Yeah, yeah, it was pretty warm out. So we decided to uh I was just going to set it there, and that night I was just going to watch and see what he does. Mm-hmm. And, uh, but actually, when we set it up in the morning, it was, you know, it was in the 70s, something like that, and then it heated up to, I think it was 92 degrees. And I was sitting at home, and I just said, you know, at least maybe if I go set down blind tonight, maybe I can see. Mm-hmm. So I sat there, so I went out there. Of course, it was really hot in that line, if I'm going to lie. <laughs> yeah, I bet. Not, not that fun, but it uh sunset and everything. And then uh, I was watching two smaller bucks. They kind of came out of this tall grass were messing around. I was watching them and through the binoculars. Just right at the top of my binoculars, I could see antlers coming through the mountain. Mm-hmm. And I thought, oh, I could just see the, the, the tips of them. Yeah. I bet you that was a sight, man. That's to see a deer oh. that big and have it like, oh man, there he is. That's got to be like a crazy feeling. Uh, I, I, the one thing I can really remember is my heart was just, I swear you could hear my heart beat. Too hard to <laughs> I bet. Uh, and I started to feel lightheaded. I'm like, oh my gosh, I got to calm down. <laughs> like buck fever on a whole nother level. Oh yeah, for sure. For sure, man. And uh, he actually disappeared into the water where those two smaller bucks mm-hmm. and i didn't i didn't see him for a while and i kept watching kept flashing and then finally i don't know how i caught him but through all this all that tall grass and stuff i could just just see his antlers through the tall grass and he was just staring a hole through that blind and he was like i know that blind wasn't there when i went to bed where did, where did that thing come from right <laughs> right yeah so i was like well i'm you know there's no way the spear's going to walk. So he disappeared. He actually went up back into the mile and disappeared a little bit. Mm-hmm. And uh, I think it was like 15 minutes before dark, he came back out. And there was a, a little four-corn buck. I remember him vividly because this four, four-corn buck was, you know, that's what killed him. <laughs> oh, really? Yeah, because he got up and started following that little buck. Well, that little buck started walking right at the edge of the mile and just right towards him. Mm-hmm. And uh, I was watching him, and all of a sudden, I, I see his suits right behind him. I just see the stack of antlers right behind this little buck. Mm-hmm. And he's just got his head down, and he's just walking right behind him, not thinking anything of it. And uh, he keeps coming and keeps coming. I said, no way. I'm going to get a shot at this thing. No way. <laughs> and that little buck got about 10 yards from the line, and he was just, he wasn't sure. He kind of started to strip this a little bit. Right, right. But Zeus kept walking. He kept going. He was about 20 yards behind him. And I remember
remember I ranged him at 34 yards, and I put the range finder down as he was still walking. I think he took two or three more steps. And I threw back, and I just eh, real lightly at him. And he stopped. He just kind of looked around, and right then I just let it go. And I knew the shot right off the get-go. I mean, it's a real good, you know, one of those hard whack sounds. Yeah, yeah diaphragm sound. Yeah. And, and I wasn't really sure of the penetration because I'd actually hit him in the front shoulder because he was quarter two. Oh, gotcha. Okay. Okay. Yeah. And, and I, but I didn't see the arrow at him as he was running off. So I thought, okay, okay, well, let's just watch him. I'll just, you know, keep, I just pull up the knockers and just kept watching him. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and he ran, ran about 75 yards. He was running just as fast as he could go through the mile after that shot. And, uh, he got to about 175 yards, and I seen his front legs come up in the air, and he just tipped over right there. No kidding. Yeah. What was yeah. that like? What was that feeling? You know, I don't know if I've ever been that emotional over something. I mean, you know, as far as deer hunting goes, that was a, you know, I I just about lost it. I, you know, I don't know if it was just pure excitement, joy, what it was, but I had a few tears coming out, I guess. Yeah, you know, I can imagine. <laughs> you work for something that hard, and you just, like I said, you know, getting pictures of one deer like that's one thing, but then get just even the opportunity right. is just like a whole up. And so then to right. be able to make that shot once you fall over was just very overwhelming. Yeah, man, for sure. And it's like one of those deer you just, you'd see on like a giant tracker segment. You don't ever expect it to happen to you. And then right. once you see a deer like that, you're like, man, this is, this is serious right now. This is a bug people okay. dream about. And it's just cool to like see an animal that unique, that kind of beat the odds of like the age class, the genetic, all that stuff that adds in to create a giant yeah. deer like that. You know what I mean? So that well, makes it even for better. Sure, for sure. You know, that when they actually had the game board and, uh, our local game board, he came and scored the deer for me uh, the next weekend. And I was talking to him about it. And, and you know, I was like, you know, how, how, did, how do these big deer like this, how do they get this big? He said, you know, it's the doe and the buck and the vine. It's, you have to, the doe has to have the right genetics and the buck has to have the right genetics to make, you know, a deer yeah. like this. Yeah. And, and the crazy thing is, you know, <laughs> These farms that I hunt aren't very big. Um, you know, I've just got permission farms. Um, and that one in particular, you know, it's like 300 acres, but I've got farms just scattered out for over, mm-hmm. you know, scattered all over. And, uh, I don't have any, like, river bottom ground to hunt or anything like that. Yeah, yeah. But it's just all mostly open fields and some ditches and stuff like that. Yeah, that's awesome, man. I like that you you kind of put in the work to, on that Milo field to kind of get uh, hone in on what pattern that you could pick them up on, and, and went in there and kind of just you 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 went after it and figured it out and were successful. And to do it, yeah. it seems like in a fairly quick amount of time from first seeing them in the Milo to getting a shot at them. Oh yeah, for sure, for sure. You know, a lot of guys, you know, they've got lots of history with them you know, sheds from previous years and everything like that. But, oh, really? But, yeah, but, but you know, here where I live, out in western Kansas, well, it's kind of central western Kansas, you know, a, a lot of our deer, it all has to do with crop rotation. Mm-hmm. You know, one year, one year this year, deer might be here, but the next three years, these, you know, four miles away somewhere else, they travel yeah. a lot mm-hmm. as far as, you know, their crop rotation. So in order to get history with them, it's, it's really a really a hard thing to do. Yeah, definitely. That's cool that like there somebody had history and all that. Did did they give you the sheds from them or anything, or did you offer to buy them, or how'd that all shake out? No, I I don't have any idea of where the sheds might be or anything like that. You know, I yeah. I just think you know a lot of guys, you know that. Oh, I thought you said someone had sheds from your oh, bug. Yeah, no, no, I wish. <laughs> yeah, that'd be cool. I uh, sorry, I misunderstood what you said then, but that's pretty cool. So tell me about like when you go up and pick this this buck up for the first time. Well, it, it, it was a really hard deal because I 
all my buddies out and everything because I watched your kid over like I knew you were dead. Yeah. Um, when we first started the initially looked for blood about an hour later, couldn't no blood, nothing. And I just thought, what in the world? I you know, I know I made a good shot, I watched you fall over. And we actually had to uh you know, there was four of us, um, and we had to just kind of start walking down the roads with a Milo until I actually finally just stumbled upon him. Yeah, yeah. Interesting. Yeah. yeah but yeah, it's sure. it's it's nice you had the confidence you watch him fall down. You're just like, he's in here somewhere. We just gotta walk up on him. So it yeah. wasn't like you probably weren't you weren't stressed that you weren't gonna find him, but you were just like, Well, we just we'll find him. Yeah, right. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So, and, and, you know, the back to the whole, you know, you never think you're ever gonna shoot a deer that big. And, and one of my bu- really good buddies is is that way, you know, he's last two years since I killed these two over two hundred. I agree with that for sure. You know, I mean, I know buddies that have a few 200 inch deer and they're humble like that. They're like, man, it's just, I put in the work, it, the genetics got to be there. A lot has to come together to make it happen, but it's definitely possible. And it's possible yeah. more now with more of the general hunting population, be a little more conscious of trying to harvest mature bucks and stuff like that. So, um, yeah. yeah, I mean, 200 inches is like the, the pinnacle of whitetail goodness, you know, um, but <laughs> It, I mean, it can happen, right? So it, yeah, you know, and you know the the funny thing is, is I actually in those uh, three days before I killed them, one of those mornings, uh, one of my really good buddies that helps me out with all this stuff, putting up stands, moving flies, and everything. Mm-hmm. You know, he was he was off work that morning, and I said, "Dude, why don't you go out there and sit? You know, mm-hmm. maybe he'll show up." And he said, "Really? You let me shoot that deer?" And I said, "Well, yeah. I mean." You know, it, yeah. I, I I think that if the opportunity ever arises, you I'd better you better take it. Yeah, I'm gonna tell you. I can't tell you not to shoot him if you're out there hunting. I mean, that'd be yeah. tough. Yeah, exactly. You know that. And then we've kind of dealt with that the last few years. Is that's like, well, I don't want to shoot that deer. You know, if you're after him, I said, hey man, if he walks in, he walks in. You know. Yeah, yeah. That's I can, cool. I yeah. Can hunt, I can hunt him for three months and never get an opportunity. Yeah, that's the thing. That's that's what makes it so sweet when it does happen. Um, the buck's yeah. insane. Um, I'm gonna have obviously photos in here overlay to the deer. He's dude. He's incredible with just the. Uh, you sent you texted me a bunch of pictures also. Just the. Yeah. Just the way he looks is awesome, man. He's like kind of tight racked, but he's just got so much junk going on. A split two. Yeah. Is it? Does he have two triple beams? It looks like or two extra beams. Yes, he does on that one side. Yeah. Yeah, yeah that's incredible. And like a drop yeah. tine, and then a, kind of another beam, an extra beam on the other side. For, he's just, he's cool, man. And the mount you got is beautiful as well. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, yeah the guy that uh, my tax service, he's usually pretty good about getting to him. Pretty yeah. Good. Yeah, he yeah. looks great, man. What a buck. And he's cool. He's real white racked. Do you think that's because he spent a lot of that time in that Milo? Well, no, I, was in a, I talked to the game board about that as well. He's, you know, he's a biologist as well. Yeah. He said uh, there's so many different factors in it. He said it could be what they're eating and what minerals are in the ground. You mm-hmm. know, I like say that Milo, what minerals are in the ground is making that Milo grow that he's eating affects the color. Yeah, I was wondering if it was like the, the trees they rub and then like if he right. spent a lot of time where the sun can hit his rack, if it would kind of like bleach his rack out a little more. Well, right. and he said too, a uh, uh, part of it is he didn't really have a lot of time to rub off stuff because, you know, I think, heck, he was only out of all but four or five days when I had actually killed him. So yeah, he yeah. A whole lot of time, you know, go rub some cedar trees or anything like that. Yeah, he's you know, an awesome and, buck. And uh, <laughs> the, I've taken people by there where I shot that deer and they said, seriously, that's where you shot him? I said, yeah. Well, there's nothing there. I said, I know. <laughs> that's <laughs> why he no, was there. No bushes, there's no nothing. And the, that's the other thing is we hunt spots that a lot of other people would just drive by and think, well, I'm not going to hunt there. There's nothing there. 
Yeah, yeah. You know, and, but when you uh, you put a camera out, you put some porn out or something, then, you know, you, you actually be really surprised. Yeah, no, I would get it, man. It's also that Buck's probably there because he thought nothing could get to him out in the open like that. So, well, cool, man. Well, I appreciate you you doing this while you're working. It's pretty funny watching the combine unload and the grain cart in there while you're doing the interview. Um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, man, congratulations on an awesome buck, and congratulations on a second 200-inch buck. That's incredible. Maybe you can send me a picture of that, too, and I'll throw that in here. Yeah, we'll do it, man. Thank you much. I really appreciate your time, sir. Yeah. Awesome, man. I appreciate you. Get back to work and thanks everyone for watching and or listening to this giant tracker segment, this episode and go shoot a giant. We'll catch you on the next one. Thanks guys.